voltaic versus electrolytic cells, the topic in this lesson. Uh, we're going to compare and contrast them this entire lesson. We're going to find out that one is spontaneous, and that means it's a reaction that naturally occurs. One is going to be non-spontaneous. It is not a reaction that's going to naturally occur. One's going to produce electricity, one's going to consume electricity, and we're going to learn all of the characteristics of both of these types of electrochemical cells here. Now this lesson is part of my high school chemistry playlist. I'm releasing these lessons weekly throughout the school year. So if you want to be notified every time I post a new one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. Okay, so these are our two t major types of electrochemical cells. We got the voltaic cell and the electrolytic cell. Now, one thing you should know right off the bat is that your voltaic cell is also called a galvanic cell. So that's another name. Those are synonymous. So treat those as the same. And, uh, and then we've got the electrolytic cell. And again, these are your two major types of electrochemical cells. Now, if we take a look here, big major difference here is that one is spontaneous, we say, and the other electrolytic here are going to be non-spontaneous. So when you think of spontaneous and non-spontaneous, so spontaneous just means something that happens without the input of outside energy. Whereas non-spontaneous is something that's not gonna happen unless we put in, you know, bring in some outside energy. So think of water flowing downhill. Water flowing down a hill, that is spontaneous. You don't have to, you know, input any energy to get that to happen, it's gonna naturally occur. Now, if you want water to flow uphill, well, we can get that to happen, but we have to might have to incorporate a pump or something like this, and there's gonna be the requirement for the input of energy to get that to happen. So that would be non-spontaneous in that case. So uh, just to kind of give you a practical example of a spontaneous versus non-spontaneous. Now, turns out for these oxidation reduction reactions, one of the big things we can use to figure out if a reaction is going to be spontaneous or not is what we call the cell potential or the voltage you might be more familiar with. And uh, often abbreviated as E cell here. Uh, and it turns out when E cell is a positive number, as it's going to be here for our voltaic cell we're going to draw, um, that's an indication it's going to be a spontaneous reaction. So whereas on the other hand, if your E cell is negative, as it is for this reaction, that is evidence that it's going to be a non-spontaneous reaction. So uh, another way of saying spontaneous here in this context, then, is that we could say that E cell is positive, whereas here we could say that E cell is negative, less than zero. So those are two big points. So got a couple reactions here that we're going to use these for uh, our examples for voltaic and electrolytic cells. So here we've got uh, copper 2 plus plus zinc. And again, I've already looked up and calculated this E cell. In the next lesson, we'll learn actually how to calculate these values using what's called a table of reduction potentials. But for now, just take it for granted that I gave this to you. This, is, this one's positive, this one's negative, this one's spontaneous, this one's non-spontaneous. All right, so some new vocab here. And it turns out that we're always going to have two electrodes so connected by a wire. And these electrodes are typically metals because we need them to be electrically conductive. So because they're gonna conduct electrons, so to speak, uh, and that's what electricity is. Now it's customary here, it turns out, to always write your anode on the left and your cathode on the right. So your two electrodes, these are their names, anode and cathode. And it turns out anode is always the site of oxidation. And cathode is always the site of reduction. So when we have an oxidation reduction reaction taking place, so oxidation will always occur at the electrode we name the anode and reduction will always take place at the uh, electrode we name the cathode. And what's convenient here is notice anode and oxidation both begin with a vowel cathode and reduction both begin with a consonant so it helps us remember uh, keep those straight what happens where so turns out for an electrolytic cell we're still going to have two electrodes connected by a wire and again those electrodes are often metals uh, there is some variation there in certain cases but they do need to be electrically conductive is the key uh, so we're going to have the anode once again on the left cathode on the right. So these are kind of your standard diagrams of the different types of electrochemical cells. And you should know it is customary to always put the anode on the left and the cathode on the right. Uh, in principle, there's no ultimate reason why you have to, but convention says uh, for decades and decades and decades that this is what we do.
All right, so an anode is still the site of oxidation and cathode is still the site of reduction. That is the definition of anode and cathode. Anode is the site of oxidation, cathode the site of reduction. And once again, the two electrodes are connected by a wire. Now you'll see with my voltaic cell, we actually separate the two half reactions, the oxidation and the reduction, into separate what we call half cells. We need them to actually be physically separate, but connected by a wire here. And the idea is that we're actually gonna have electrons traveling through this wire. And when you have electrons traveling through that wire, as long as they're traveling in the spontaneous direction, they have a chance to do work along the way. The same way that we have water flowing downhill spontaneously, and it has a chance to do work. We might use it to turn uh, the turbine of a generator and produce electricity. Same kind of thing here. Here, the traveling of the electrons actually is electricity, uh, and we can use that to do work. It might pass through the coils of your uh, uh, toaster coils or something like that and give off lots of heat. It might pass through a tungsten filament and give off lots of light. So, but it's going to do some work along the way. But if we don't actually separate them into different half cells, there's no traveling of those electrons. So you might just, you know, whoever gets oxidized might just hand the electrons off to whoever gets reduced directly. And there's no chance to do work in that case. So we've got to separate these into different half cells here. All right. So if the anode is the place where electrons are lost and the cathode is the place where electrons are gained, well, what we're gonna find then is that the electrons are gonna travel through this wire here and they're gonna have to, by definition, travel from the anode to the cathode. Again, the anodes were oxidation where electrons are lost, cathode is reduction where electrons are gained, so electrons can only go from where they're lost to where they're gained. And that's gonna be true over here in our electrolytic cell as well. So once again, we're gonna have electrons traveling through the wire from anode to cathode. Now, big difference here is in the voltaic cell, this is a spontaneous flow of electrons. This is the direction the electrons wanna flow. We like to say that this is the downhill direction of flow for them. And one way to uh, signify that is that the anode, it turns out, is gonna be negative and the cathode positive. Now, when we say negative and positive here, so what we really mean is negative means lower potential and positive means higher potential. And that's a little bit tricky. So, but this would be analogous to the negative terminal on your car battery and the positive terminal on your car battery. And one's lower potential, one's higher potential. And it turns out electrons spontaneously flow from low potential to high potential. Now, personally, I find it very convenient to kind of think of these as being negatively charged and positively charged even though it actually refers to potential, which is the same thing as voltage. But if you look at it in terms of, say, charge, it actually helps you establish the spontaneous direction here. So with electrons being negatively charged, they'd be repelled from the negative, attracted to the positive, and they'd spontaneously want to flow this way. Now, again, these aren't really about charge. It really is about potential, but it is convenient that it works that way. Now, if we look at the uh, electrolytic cell, we're going to find out actually that it's the anode that's positive and the cathode that is negative. And so now the electrons actually downhill want to flow the other direction. What we're going to do though is we're going to force them to go flow the opposite direction. And the way we're going to force them to do so is we're going to plug this into some sort of power source. We're going to plug it into a battery. We're going to plug it into the wall. In some way, shape, or form, this needs a power source that's going to force the electrons to go the way they don't want to go. So electrons always travel from anode to cathode, period, by definition. The question though is do they wanna flow that way? And so that's why the anode negative cathode positive in the voltaic cell, and that is the spontaneous direction, anode to cathode. But again, they're still flowing anode to cathode, but now it's the anode that's positive, the cathode that's negative, and so they don't wanna flow that way, and we need the input of power to force this non-spontaneous reaction to happen. Okay, so other characteristic here. So again, here we have a spontaneous reaction happening, which we can tell based on E cell. And so it turns out these are also going to produce electricity. So, and in this case, producing electricity might not be the best way to phrase this, but I think it's the one that's gonna resonate most with you. So we're gonna say it that way. So produce electricity. So we're using a spontaneous reaction to produce electricity. Whereas over here, we have a non-spontaneous reaction that we're forcing to happen. And how do we get it to happen? With a power source, and we're gonna consume electricity instead. All right, so if we take a look at the specific reactions we've got going on here. So we wanna identify the different half reactions here. And so if we take a look, here we've got zinc, going to zinc two plus. 
And what you'll find about a lot of different oxidation reduction reactions involved in batteries is they often involve a, a solid metal and a corresponding metal ion. So, and when that's the case, it's nice because the solid metal is electrically conductive and that's what you'll make the actual electrode out of. So in this case, zinc to zinc two plus, that's the loss of two electrons. And so that is our oxidation half reaction and oxidation occurs at the anode. So over here, we're gonna make this electrode from zinc solid. And then we'd have to have some zinc two plus dissolved in the solution around it. And so typically these are surrounded by aqueous solution here. So by water, and we're gonna have whatever ions we need dissolved in that solution. Now, if we look at the other half reaction, so here we're gonna have copper two plus go into copper solid, and that is reduction. So in this case, the gain of two electrons. And once again, we've got a metal ion aqueous and then the solid metal itself. And yet again, we're gonna use the solid metal itself as the electrode. We're using that's the material to make the electrode out of. And then the metal ion has to be dissolved in the solution. Now, if you want to have these solutions full of these metal ions, which the way you get those in there is you dissolve a salt, you know, just pour uh, uh, some granules of an appropriate zinc salt over here and appropriate copper salt over here. But what that means is you had to pour in the entire salt, the entire ionic compound. You can't have a cation without the corresponding anion because the way they got into solution is that you poured in a salt. And so in this case, I'm going to say maybe we used zinc sulfate and copper sulfate as the salts to get in there. And so in addition to zinc ions, we have sulfate ions. In addition to copper ions, we have sulfate ions, but these are spectator ions. They're not part of our balanced reaction in any way, shape or form, but we had to use some sort of salt. And so typically we'll use like either zinc and copper nitrate or zinc and copper sulfate or something like that. Okay. So if we take a look at the reaction that's actually going on here, so here the zinc solid is turning into zinc two plus, and that is interesting in that the electrode itself is the reactant and is being used up. And so this electrode over time is going to lose mass. So that electrode itself is going to lose mass over time as the zinc solid turns into zinc two plus. On the other side will be the exact opposite. So here the copper two plus is gonna be turned into copper solid. And so it turns out when the zinc turns into zinc two plus, it loses two electrons and those electrons are gonna flow downhill through the wire and they're gonna sit on the surface of this electrode just waiting for copper two plus to come and bump into it. And when copper two plus comes and bumps into this electrode, it gains those two electrons and it turns into copper solid at the same time. And if it turns into copper solid as a product here, while well, it's in contact with more copper, it's gonna end up bonded to it and making this electrode fatter. And so we like to say that this electrode over here is going to gain mass over time. Cool, oftentimes we call when a metal uh, is formed on the surface of another metal, we call it plating out. And so in this case, copper solid is gonna be plating out on the cathode. Okay, now this gives us a certain problem though. So it turns out you can't let a charge buildup occur in either one of these solutions. So that charge buildup uh, is very non-spontaneous. So if you look at, you know, positive charges, you know, congregating together, they don't like each other. They repel each other. Same thing with negative charges. And so initially before we plug this battery in, so to speak, before we say flip a switch or something, uh, you'd have an equal amount of zinc ions and sulfate ions on this side and copper ions and sulfate ions on this side. However, on this side, you're going to get more and more zinc two plus ions because you're producing it as a product. And on this side, you're going to be using up your copper two plus ions. And so you'd have an excess of negative ions. So on this side, we have an excess of cations, this side, an excess of anions, and those buildup of positive charge on this side and negative charge on this side is a problem that will actually keep the battery from even functioning. And so it turns out to solve that problem, we have to connect the solutions with a bridge. And we call this bridge salt bridge because it's gonna be filled with a salt. And in this case, we might put some sodium ions and some nitrate ions. So we'll just fill it with a solution of sodium nitrate. And typically we'll fill it with like a gel-like matrix in this glass tube, if you will. And in that gel matrix, we will dissolve some sodium nitrate solution. And so on this side, when we have a buildup of cations going on, we're gonna have these anions flow into the anode compartment. So here are the nitrate ions are gonna flow into the 
uh, anode compartment. So what's nice is that it's easy to remember. In the salt bridge, anions flow into the anode. And on the other side, when we're using up the cations, we'd have a buildup of negative charge. So to balance that out, we'll have cations flow into the cathode compartment. And so in this case, anions flow to the anode, cations flow to the cathode through the salt bridge. Makes it easy to remember. So one thing to keep in mind, uh, in comparison contrast, makes some great true-false kind of questions and stuff like that, is that electrons flow through the wire from anode to cathode. But ions flow through the salt bridge, anions to anode, cations to cathode. So great things we can test you on there. And again, without this salt bridge, this is a dead battery. That salt bridge is essential. Cool. That is your voltaic cell. Let's kind of compare and contrast that with what's going on here at the electrolytic cell. So when we do what's called electrolysis, so electrolysis is kind of the, the generic term we talk about with the reaction that's happening at the electrolytic cell. When we do electrolysis, it turns out this only works if you have mobile ions, we say. And when we say mobile, I mean like, you know, like is Tom Brady a mobile quarterback? Well, he's not considered one. Is Kyler Murray considered a mobile quarterback? Yes, he is. So he's my hometown quarterback, FYI. So mobile just means like moves out of the pocket and is fast or something like that. So in this case, uh, when we say that we need mobile ions, we just need ions that can move around. And that's not possible when you have a solid salt. So if you just take some, you know, salt out of your cabinet, uh, uh, in a salt shaker or something like that, that's not going to work. you got two options. You can either dissolve that salt in water, in which case the ions will dissociate and swim around in the water, and we'll have mobile ions. We would call that aqueous electrolysis. So the other option is that you actually you heat the salt so super hot that it melts. And typically this requires super high temperatures because uh, ionic compounds typically have very high melting points. And so it turns out when you melt a salt, it often is referred to as a molten salt. Notice that many rocks are predominantly composed of ionic compounds, and so when you melt a rock, you call it molten lava, and it's at super high temperatures. Same thing when you melt any ionic compound. Once it's melted, that liquid salt is called a molten salt. All right, and so, and when you're doing electrolysis with a melted salt, we call it molten electrolysis. So there's molten electrolysis and then there's aqueous electrolysis. And molten electrolysis is gonna take a lot of energy because you gotta heat that salt way hot to melt it. Whereas aqueous electrolysis, you can technically do it at room temperature because all you gotta do is dissolve the salt in water. Now we're not gonna deal with aqueous electrolysis a lot here. If you take AP chemistry or college uh, freshman chemistry, you'll you'll treat it more there. I just wanna make sure you know that we, we do have to have mobile ions for electrolysis uh, and aqueous or liquid salts are, are options. Well, we're only gonna deal with liquid salts. The aqueous actually adds some complication. When you put water into the mix, well, it turns out water can get oxidized and reduced and it makes this much more complicated and too complicated for a typical high school class. So, but we will deal with just molten electrolysis when we have a molten salt. And in this case, it turns out uh, we're going to learn how to predict the products in a little bit, but simply what's going to happen if you've got a binary salt composed of just a, a simple monatomic cation and monatomic anion, so no polyatomic ions, which is the only type you're going to deal with here, you just simply form the elements. And so here we started off with sodium in the plus one oxidation state. We started with chloride in the minus one oxidation state. And the sodium goes from plus one to the zero oxidation state, elemental sodium metal. And the chlorine goes from the negative oxidation like negative one oxidation state to the zero oxidation state, in this case, diatomic chlorine gas in its elemental form. And so electrolysis for our purposes is, is gonna be what we use to form elements. So it turns out this is actually often how we form chlorine gas. So chlorine gas is used uh, in like water treatment for purification, it's antibacterial in nature and stuff like this. Uh, and all of the industrial CL2 that we use is actually produced via electrolysis. So there's quite a few things that we produce with exactly this process. All right, so let's take a look at sodium chloride in electrolysis here. And, and in this case, I'm gonna put some sodium ions over here and some chloride ions over here. And keep in mind again, in this case, I, I know this so is blue. This is not water, it was actually melted salt in this case. So there's no water present. And what we're gonna find is that the sodium ions are gonna be attracted to the negative electrode, the chloride ions are gonna be, let's draw that in red, let's be consistent here. And the chloride ions will be attracted to the positive electrode. So the chloride ions are gonna go from Cl minus to turning into Cl2 here. 
So, and when they do, two of them will do that, they'll lose two electrons, and those electrons will be pumped, because it's not spontaneous, they'll be pumped over to the cathode. So, and then sodium's gonna come and bump into that cathode and gain those electrons and turn into sodium metal. Now here, notice I didn't actually put a phase on sodium metal here, and that becomes, it really depends on the temperature at which this is performed. If you recall, we said that this has to happen at a super hot temperature. To melt NaCl, it's like somewhere around 800 degrees Celsius. Well, it turns out the melting point of sodium metal is, I think, somewhere around 200 degrees Celsius. And so all of a sudden, if you're doing this at 800 degrees Celsius, the truth is the sodium metal you're probably producing is probably gonna be initially in the liquid phase until you cool it down. So I didn't include it there because some people might write it in a solid, but technically, if you're actually doing this, it's probably initially gonna be produced as a liquid. I wouldn't expect you to know that and neither would your chemistry teacher. All right, so once again, we've got electrons still flowing from anode to cathode, so, but it's not spontaneous in this case because again, the anode's positive and the cathode negative. Cool, so this is kind of the big thing here. If you notice again, we don't have this in separate half cells. This is one giant solution, but we're not trying to you know, produce electricity and have it do work here. Again, this is not producing electricity, it is consuming electricity, and this all just happens in one giant container instead. So before we move on, we wanna take a look at a couple of specific voltaic cells. And again, your voltaic cells are typically what we refer to as batteries. Now, technically when you are recharging a battery, it's acting as an electrolytic cell in that one instance. But when it's actually supplying electricity, it's acting as a voltaic cell. And uh, there's a handful of ones you might, you know, commonly have discussed in, in, in a typical course. And we're gonna discuss two of them, just so you kind of know the kind of things we, we wanna know about them and identify them. Uh, in this case, the first we're gonna look at is the lead storage battery, then we'll take a look at the hydrogen fuel cell. In the lead storage battery, this is your typical car battery. Uh, and in this case, it's got a, a standard cell potential of two volts, fairly spontaneous, uh, again, being a positive number. Uh, it turns out your typical car battery though is a 12 volt battery. So how do we go from two volts to 12 volts? Well, we actually just take six of these lead cells and hook them up in series. And it turns out when you hook batteries up in series, uh, the effect is additive. So you guys have experienced this also with like, you know, when a, one of your devices say uses, you know, multiple AA or AAA batteries and you have to orient them in the proper way. And the, right, the reason you have to orient them in the right way is that they're being hooked up in series. That way it's additive, you know, a typical, uh, alkaline cell, which is your double or triple A battery, is just one and a half volts. Well, if you've got a device that needs six volts, well, then you're going to need four of those minimum to make that work. So that's kind of the deal here. So a uh, couple things that are nice about the, the lead storage battery. Um, one, two volts is a pretty good number. And the fact that you can hook them up in series and get 12 volts, that's good as well. One of the bad things is that lead's heavy. Uh, you know, now we'd much prefer to use lithium uh, as far as the weight factor. And it turns out lithium is also going to end up with the lift, standard lithium batteries. It's actually going to have more voltage associated with it too. So lithium's got a couple advantages. Now, lithium's a little more reactive and, and uh, from a mining standpoint, they're both fairly prevalent out there. So, but lead might be a little bit easier to get. So one other big advantage to the lead battery here is that all, all the major lead components are all in the solid phase, which means they don't really have a concentration associated with them. And uh, that's actually a really nice thing. And it's not going to be completely obvious to you. Uh, in a sense, but it turns out um, that, you know, most batteries are going to run down in their voltage over time. As you start using up the reactants and making more products, most batteries are going to have their voltage go down. So because most of them are going to have components that are either uh, aqueous or gases, usually aqueous components. Well, when they're all solids, it turns out that doesn't happen. And so we don't have to worry about this running down over time. Now, eventually your battery might, you know, die or it might get completely used up if your alternator breaks or something like this. Uh, it turns out it might short out on the inside between some of these separate, these six separate cells or something. Um, but barring those things, it would actually last forever. You could charge it and recharge it, you know, uh, back and forth, discharge it, I should say, and, and recharge it back and forth to eternity if it didn't break. Um, Cool, but what's nice is as long as it's discharging though, it doesn't actually normally decrease along the way. Now, if we look at who's getting oxidized or reduced here, so lead and lead oxide here is in a plus four oxidation state and elemental lead is in the zero. And both of them end up being converted into lead sulfate, which is the plus two oxidation state. And so in this case, we can see that the lead from in lead oxide here is going from plus four to plus two. That's going down, that's reduction. And so lead oxide is gonna be at the cathode. So where's the lead going from zero to plus two? That's going up, that's oxidation. That's gonna occur at the anode. So you might have to identify an anode and a cathode based on the balanced reaction in a typical battery like this. Okay, that's the lead storage battery. 
Now we'll take a look at the hydrogen fuel cell, and uh, the hydrogen uh, fuel cell got a, a lot of buzz uh, a little while ago and, and started being used in cars to a limited extent and stuff like this, and it kind of just kind of disappeared from, from uh, the mainstream and stuff, but it's, it's making a comeback again. And uh, the big thing is just getting a, a good source of hydrogen because you need a lot of it and then storing it in your car or having it produced gradually in your car or something like that. It's very flammable. It's got to be kept under pressure. So there's some, some issues and some logistics to work out. So, but not a bad reaction. So E cell here is 1.23 volts. Uh, but a lot of that is going to be really affected by, you know, the partial pressures of your gases involved here. So the higher you can get these partial pressures, the higher you can actually get that voltage. So turns out we, we talk about the standard cell potential. And that's what that little circle means, standard. And that would refer to the fact that you've got one atmosphere partial pressures of all your gases. So, and whether or not we have one atmosphere pressures and stuff like that's actually going to affect what we, number we and in, in practice, this number is usually a little bit lower than the standard number I'm giving you here. Uh, but, but a nice reaction. You know, there's plenty of hydrogen out there. Uh, we can get a hydrogen by doing electrolysis on water. And there's lots of water all over the oceans and stuff like this. So we have plentiful supplies of hydrogen. That's not our problem. Our problem is some of the logistics on the other side. This is also used as rocket fuel. It turns out this is you know, your rocket fuel reaction as well. Um, doing the exact same kind of process here, but not necessarily producing electricity uh, in the case of rocket fuel. Um, but that's it. If you look at who's being oxidized and who's being reduced yet again, so notice your reactants are both elements in their elemental forms. They're diatomic, but they're still in the zero oxidation state. And then the products, hydrogen's plus one, oxygen's minus two. And we can see that it's oxygen that went down from zero to minus two. And so that's reduction, and that's going to occur at the cathode. So, and then hydrogen here is going from zero up to plus one. That's losing electrons, so that's oxidation. And that's going to occur at the anode. I said oxidation, I really wanted to write anode. And so we could also identify what's going on at the anode and cathode in the hydrogen fuel cell as well. And like I said, there's some other batteries out there, like the alkaline cell, the dry cell, a um, handful of others that you maybe or maybe not going to get presented. So if, if a professor is running out of time at the end of the school year, this is an area they often uh, make some omissions to save time. So maybe you didn't even see these two. So, but I at least wanted you to see kind of the level and degree to which we cover these. And you might just be asked some, some more descriptive uh, questions regarding these different batteries. So let's take a look at now uh, a little more about electrolysis as well to finish this off. And we already looked at electrolysis of liquid NaCl. And we already saw the products. And I just want to make sure and re reiterate this, that when you're doing electrolysis, molten electrolysis of a binary salt made of only two elements, a cation and anion, you are just going to produce both of those elements in their elemental form. And so in this case, we're going to get elemental sodium and elemental chlorine. And in this case, recall that sodium and sodium chloride is plus one, chloride is minus one, and now we're turning them into elements in their zero oxidation states. And so the question is, which one got reduced? Well, going from plus one down to zero, that's the gaining of electrons, that's reduction. And so it's sodium getting produced at the cathode. Chlorine going from negative one up to zero, that's gonna be produced at the anode. Notice I'm not balancing anything here, but I do want you to see, not only might you be asked to predict the products of molten electrolysis of a binary salt, and it's just the elements, but you might be asked which one forms at which electrode. And the cation gets reduced to its elemental form at the cathode, the anion gets oxidized to its elemental form at the anode. So cation at the cathode, anion at the anode, it once again makes it easy to remember. Let's do one more. And the last one here we're gonna take a look at So it's aluminum oxide here, and once again, it's a binary salt. You've just got a simple cation and anion, uh, no polyatomic ions or anything like that, which we're not going to ask you. Uh, and if we have to predict electrolysis here, and once again, I probably should have written that this is going to be molten liquid here. So again, if you do aqueous, you got to worry about water, because water sometimes can get oxidized or reduced and affect what products you might get. But we're not going to deal with that. We're not going to treat that in this class. We're only going to deal with treating the products of molten electrolysis. And in this case, we're just going to form elemental aluminum and elemental oxygen. Now, elemental aluminum is simply aluminum, but elemental oxygen we're going to form as O2. And those are our products. And once again, so cation at the cathode. And so aluminum is going from plus three down to the zero oxidation state. That's reduction. That's going to happen at the cathode. Oxygen is going from the minus two oxidation state to the zero oxidation state. That's oxidation. And that's going to occur at the anode. And we've now covered all of the characteristics
uh, and examples you need to know regarding both voltaic and electrolytic cells. Now, if you have found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? The best thing you can do to make sure that other students get to see this lesson as well. If you're looking for the study guide that goes with the lesson, if you are looking for oxidation reduction reaction practice problems involving voltaic and electrolytic cells, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.